Do you love the picture on the screen? I love the picture. It's our galaxy there. And I don't know if you can see, I've, I figured out where you are. <laughs> You're right there. Uh, open your Bibles if you'd like to Nehemiah chapter 12. There is a Bible app event for this, and you can follow along that way if you would like to. I want to tell you that later in the message, I'm going to share with you some of the thinking from a sermon preached some 30 years ago by Alistair Begg, and uh, probably toward the end, I'll tell you where this is because he phrases something so well and thinks through this passage in a way that I hadn't before. And I have the link for that message. If you'd like it, I'd be glad to give you that link and you can listen to him as he elaborates on that, but I'm going to touch on it today. So years ago, I was speaking to the gentleman who lived right across the road from the church in a, in a house right there, right behind me now where I'm standing. Uh, his name was Todd Vaughn. How many of you know Todd Vaughn or knew Todd Vaughn? Yeah, okay, good. Maybe 10, 10 20% of us here. Todd and his wife attended our church here, and uh, I'd be out on a walk or something. He'd be out in his lawn. He had the kind of lawn that he used a vacuum cleaner. I mean, it was just perfect, right? And so he and I were standing in the lawn, and we're talking about that. I was being careful not to mess up the grass too much. And as we're talking together there, um, we were talking about our families. And his grandchildren came up. And as I remember it, he said, yeah, my grandchildren, they live in the vicinity of Orlando, Florida, and they've been to Disneyland, and they've tasted everything down at Disneyland more times than you can imagine. Disney World, Disney, whatever you want to call it, right? But Todd said, but here's what's weird, Pastor Steve. Their favorite place to vacation is Kerwinsville, Pennsylvania. And I laughed. I thought, well, we know why that is. It's because grandpa's here. That's why that is. They're lying to you and telling you that you're their favorite, right? He said, when they come to Kerbinsville, they're not here for grandpa. They're here for something called Del Grosso Amusement Park <laughs> in Tipton, Pennsylvania. They love it. And I said, they have Disney. They prefer Del Grosso. And it always made Todd chuckle whenever we'd think about that story because Del Grosso seems so ordinary compared to Disney. But Todd said his grandkids would rather go to Del Grosso any day of the week. There is significance in the ordinary. These chapters of Nehemiah that we're going to look at this morning, they're about ordinary people doing ordinary things. I mean, take a look. We're not going to read these chapters, and you can thank God for that right now because they're long and they have a lot of names, and I'm thanking God because I'd have to say those names, right? But take a look, if you would, at verses 1 and 2 of Nehemiah 11. It says, Now the leaders of the people settled in Jerusalem. The rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of every ten of them to live in Jerusalem, the holy city while the remaining nine were to stay in their own towns. The people commended all those who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. Now, you know what has happened here. Jerusalem was a mess just, what, maybe six weeks earlier? Six, yeah, I don't know, 52 days earlier. It was a mess, and they had built the walls around Jerusalem and worked on the infrastructure inside, and, and now they want people who are willing to live there. And that's what these people are doing. They're living in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And then it goes on to list their names, where they came from, whose kids they were, all that. The list goes on and on. You want to see an example of that? Move to chapter 12 and read the first verse there. It says, These were the priests and Levites who returned with Zerubbabel, son of Shelatel, and with Joshua. And then there's a colon, and it begins to list their names, one after another. And it goes on and on. Now look down in, in verse 12 of Nehemiah 12, and you can see another example. It says, in the days of Jehoiakim, these were the heads of the priestly families, colon. And here's the list, on and on and on. It's a list of names of people who are doing things. That's pretty much it. And I'm almost sure that these chapters are not on anyone's top 10 Bible passages list. I mean... Can you imagine reading through this whole thing? 
Reverend Evil Sizer, would you please come and read these two chapters to us this morning? Yeah, can you imagine that? That would just be ah, way laborious. But these names are here. These words are here in the Bible for a reason. Do you know how I know that? Because the Apostle Paul, when he's talking to a young man, a young pastor named Timothy, he's writing him a letter, and Paul says this. I'll put it on the screen. He says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. I've heard someone different say half a dozen times in the past couple months, well, you know, men wrote the Bible. Indeed, they did. But God breathed it. It is God breathed. Even the very word that we use to say, man, I just feel like when you painted that painting, you were inspired. We borrow that word inspire from the word inspiration, which means spirit breathed, God breathed. And these words aren't inspired like the Mona Lisa. They are inspired from the mind of God. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. I think that God breathed these words to maybe teach us the significance of the ordinary because there is great significance in the ordinary. If you're serving in the public eye, like I'm doing right now, and you're doing it with a heart that desires to honor God and serve him and please him and serve the people, then you're significant and what you're doing is significant. And if you're serving in the hidden places, in the ordinary places, back in the nursery with maybe just one kid, or maybe you're in the kitchen doing some cleanup, just you or maybe you and a friend back there, if you're doing that with a heart that wants to honor God and love God and wants to serve him, then God honors, honors that just the same. He sees it as significant. You see, you don't have to shake the world to have value. CBS asked, uh, recently asked 16-year-olds what they wanted to be. What do you want to do with your life? What career, 16-year-old, are you interested in having? The most common response was, I think, five words. I want to be famous. And it wasn't just like that's common because 30% of them said it and then the others. 56% said I want to be famous in my life. And it wasn't that they wanted to be like a famous physician who cures polio or a famous statesman who brings peace. I want to be an influencer. That's what I want to be. 96% of those surveyed said that they want to earn their living by posting on social media. Huh. Now that longing is not new. And let's not condemn young people because we're all the same. Nobody wants to be a nobody. Everybody wants to be somebody. But you don't have to shake the world to be somebody. You don't have to shake the world to be extraordinary. Nehemiah knew what it was to be extraordinary. He and the people around him, him engaged in just an amazing thing together. They rebuilt the walls of a city in 52 days. And they knew as they were doing it, this is a pretty extraordinary, significant thing we're undertaking. We know that they knew this because back in chapter six, do you remember those two bad guys, God Farkas and his toady? Remember those kind of? It, it was uh, Sambala and Tobiah. They were trying to get, they were trying to get Nehemiah to come out to a different location where they could get him alone and they could kill him because they wanted to stop what was going on there. And you may or may not remember Nehemiah's reply in Nehemiah 6. He says, I'm carrying on a great project. He knew this is significant. And I cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Now, he doesn't say that just to save his skin, although I'm sure he does say that to save his skin. But he says it because he knows, I am doing something extraordinary here. I am building the walls. This is significant. 
I am significant. We are significant. But listen to this. Those people did not cease to be significant after that project was over. They did not become insignificant because they were no longer working on that particular project. Whether we realize it or not, ordinary people living ordinary lives have an extraordinary impact. Jim Smith. Is there a Jim Smith here today? Do you know it's one of the most common names in America, at least it was when the Jim Smith I'm thinking about was born in 1941. Jim Smith had an ordinary name. He had an ordinary job. He had an ordinary home. He had an ordinary family. He had an extraordinary daughter. I married her. He had an ordinary son-in-law, the other one. (laughs) He lived an ordinary life. But on his deathbed, his 50-some-year-old nephew, driving 200 miles to get to his side, knowing he was dying with cancer, drove there just to say this, Uncle Jim, thank you for telling me about Jesus. I don't know if I would be saved today if you hadn't told me how to be saved. Thank you for doing that. (laughs) Wow. Wouldn't you love (laughs) to hear that when you're on your deathbed from someone? Wouldn't that be beautiful? I can only think of one thing I would rather hear. I would rather hear the doctor say, you know, I think you're getting better. No, I don't even know if I'd want to hear that more than what nephew Donnie said. Jim was an ordinary man who made an extraordinary impact. It would seem to me that Jesus values the ordinary maybe more than the extravagant. In Matthew 25, when he's doing the sheep's and the goat's judgment thing, he says to the sheep in verse 35, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Are you beginning to get a feel, to get a sense of the significance of the ordinary? Do you feel it? Do you sense it? The kingdom is made of the ordinary. You know, when I think of the kingdom and the ordinary and the role we who are ordinary have in it, I think of a word that theologians use when they talk about the family of God. It's the word interdependence. We're not independent, like, I don't need anybody, you know? Nor are we dependent and needy, like, oh, I really need everybody. But we are interdependent, that is, we need one another. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and he talks about how that group of people, the the family of God there, the, the church, that portion of the kingdom together, along with all the kingdom, is like a physical human body. And the parts of the human body, they depend on one another. And he says there in 1 Corinthians 12, 15, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I don't belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, well, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of 
hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? And then he says, but in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. And they are interdependent, depending one on the other. Think of the ordinary things that must happen to make your Sunday morning meaningful. I mean, if you're watching online, that is because some ordinary people put together a pretty ordinary video system in order to stream it, and a couple of them are sitting back there right now making sure that it's working so that you can watch it. It's ordinary people doing that. Ordinary people are serving as nursery workers right now so that you, on this communion Sunday, can really focus your thoughts on what's going on and what's happening here in the body of Christ and what God might want to say to you. Ordinary people in the nursery. Ordinary people <laughs> make sure that this table's here. There's this ordinary guy that the first Sunday of every month, he wheels out this table so communion can be made available here for you. And then some ordinary deaconesses make sure that there's bread and that each of the cups is filled so that you can enjoy communion. Ordinary people take the children upstairs and teach them on their own level so children can learn on their level and so that you can be here hearing this and learning on your level. And this ordinary guy stands up here and talks into this ordinary microphone and speaks to you on Sunday morning. Ordinary tasks done by ordinary people. But the significance of those tasks would be all too evident if they were undone. If you look at Nehemiah 11 and 12, you can see that God gives to the ordinary a sense of significance. Begg uses a very creative way to draw this out of the passage of the people in Nehemiah 11 and 12 as they're in and around Jerusalem. And he says, just ask them what they're doing and what would they reply? It may seem insignificant, but is it? So let's use Begg's tool and do that. I mean, if you ask the people in chapter 11, verses 1 and 2 that we read earlier, if you said to them, what are you doing here? I think they might answer, I'm living here. I'm living here. They're not doing something dramatic. They're just living in Jerusalem. And verse 2 says the people commended all who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. It's a small thing but it's an important thing. Just like your presence here today is an important thing. I mean, you may feel like your presence on a Sunday morning isn't all that important, but if you weren't here this morning, you would be missed. I would miss you, people around you would miss you. The seat you're sitting in would be empty, and if there's someone sitting beside you, they would be alone, perhaps. You wouldn't be here to give your, oh, wow, this will date me. This is before I was born, this commercial, because my, my mom and dad used to talk about it. You wouldn't be around to flash your Pepsodent smile. Yeah, right? Your word of encouragement, your handshake, your warm greeting, all that would be absent. In fact, if no ordinary people were here, what would the peace of the kingdom of God that we call Kerwinsville Alliance, what would it look like? An empty building with black pews, black seats in it, non-existent. See, there are ordinary people doing an ordinary thing in Jerusalem. They're living there. And the book of Nehemiah, in the book of Nehemiah, God put their name on the page. Let's ask another group of people this question. Chapter 11, verse 12, let's say to them, what are you doing here? These people are going to say, I'm working here. What are you doing here? I'm working here. 822 men, it says. Oh, look at it. 
in Nehemiah 11:11, 11, 11, it says, Saraiah, son of Hilkiah, the son, son of Meshulam, the son of Zadok, the son of Mariath, the son of Ahitub, the official in charge of the house of God, and their associates who, here it is, carried on the work for the temple, 822 men. That seems like a bunch, doesn't it? That seems like a lot. But each one of them was significant. They're kind of like the janitor carrying a broom in NASA Space Center in 1962, and President John F. Kennedy is taking a tour of the facility, and he sees the janitor, janitor, and he breaks formation with Secret Service and goes over and sticks out his hand and says, Hi, I'm Jack Kennedy. What are you doing? And the janitor responds, I'm helping put a man on the moon, Mr. President. <laughs> I don't know if that story is true or not, but boy, that's good, isn't it? Yeah. That janitor knows I have a broom, but I'm significant. He's working here. You see it going on in chapter 11, verse 15 and 16. From the Levites, Shemaiah, son of Hashab, son of Azirakam, the son of Hashabiah, the son of Buni, Shabathiah, and Jazabad, two of the heads of the Levites who had, and here it is, who had charge of the outside work of the house of God. Ordinary people doing ordinary work inside and outside the house of God. They're doing things like taking care of the finances. They're, okay, brace yourself, I'm gonna sing. They're fixing a hole where the rain gets in. That's a Beatles phrase, I just had to put it in there. You know, we got a hole in our roof right now. That'll be fixed by ordinary people, ordinary people. They're taking care of finances. They're fixing a hole where the roof, <laughs> where rain comes in rather. They're taking care of the property. They're making arrangements for activities. They're cleaning up after activities. They're serving, they're, they're doing ordinary things. They're working there. And in the book of Nehemiah, God puts their name on the page. Wow, how could you feel insignificant? The people in 1117, I think this is pretty cool. If you were to say to them, what are you doing here? They would say, I'm praying here. I'm praying here. Look at the first part of verse 17, chapter 11. Mataniah, son of Micah, the son of Zabdi, the son of Asaph, the director who led in thanksgiving and prayer. Praying, giving thanks helping others do the same. And I've told you this before, it shames me to tell it, <laughs> but I used to have this terrible habit, it's so embarrassing. Someone from my church, I was a young pastor, someone from my church would say, I have this need, pastor, I have this need. And I would say something like this to them, I'll pray about that, I wish I could do more. All I can do is pray. You hear what I'm saying when I say those words? Man, I wish there was something I could do that would be significant and actually help with the problem, but I guess all I can do is pray. It changed me to say that. I can tell you when that changed. That changed when my father had his first heart attack. Dave and Terry volunteered to keep our kids while Laurel and I drove the three hours from Bradford, Pennsylvania, down to Presbyterian Hospital in Pittsburgh. <laughs> and as we're getting ready to leave, Terry, who's taking our kids, is tapping on Laurel's window, and I'm like, come on, I gotta get going. It's after the church service on Sunday morning. She, and, and I roll down the window, and, and she says, Pastor Steve, don't worry about your kids. We'll take good care of them. Stay as long as you need to. And Pastor Steve, you prayed for my mom when she was sick. I'll be praying for your dad. Now, I don't want to underemphasize the blessing of knowing that your kids are with a good family and they'll be taken care of. But I can tell you the statement that most touched my heart was, uh, I'll pray for your dad. I'll pray for your dad. The people noted here are doing very ordinary things. They prayed. And in the book of Nehemiah, God put their name on the page. Ask the people in chapter 12, verse 8. 
what are you doing here? And they'll say, I'm singing here. <laughs> I'm singing here. They're the worship team. <laughs> That's who they are. In Nehemiah 12, 8, it says the Levites were Jeshua, Benoai, Kadmael, Sherebiah, Judah, and also Matanai, who, together with his associates, was in charge of the songs of thanksgiving. I've heard people say, and I fear perhaps I might have been one of those people, when they speak of the music and they speak of the offering and they speak of, of the prayer time, I've heard them refer to those things as preliminaries. Let's get these preliminaries out of the way so we can get to the real thing, the sermon. I repent of ever having said that if I did. Because I believe the sermon's important. I work really hard to write my sermons. I remember 25 years ago, someone said, your pa Pastor, your sermons just aren't making it for me. I said, I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> yeah. So I believe that the sermon is important, but let me say this with absolute clarity. Worship in song, worship in giving, the quietness in prayer, those are just as significant in God's eyes. Some people here in this passage are doing some ordinary things. They sang. And in the book of Nehemiah, God put their name on the page. How about one more? Ask the people in 1225 what they're doing. They're going to say, I am keeping watch. Look at uh, 1225. It says, Mataniah, Bakbukiah, Obadiah, Meshalam, Talman, and Akub were the gatekeepers who guarded the storerooms at the gates. You know, the role of a guard seems pretty unimportant until you need a guard, right? <laughs> and then you see the significance of the ordinary. These people, they were doing ordinary things. They kept watch. And God, God put their names on the page in the book of Nehemiah. You don't have to be a world shaker to be significant. There is significance in the ordinary, but, but understand there are some requirements to seeing the significance of the ordinary. And the first of those is to have the right perspective. You have to have a perspective that said, God defines significance, not me, not my peers, not my classmates, not my girlfriend, not the people I hang out with, not the people I work with, God defines significance. And if, if you don't understand that it's God's responsibility to say what is, per, what is significant, if you don't have that perspective, then your life values will always be out of sync with reality. And you'll be chasing uh, things that just have no meaning at all. So you might want to look at your perspective on significance. Who taught you what, what, it, what it means to be significant. I mean, did you learn that on a sitcom? You might have. Did you learn it from the media? You very well may have. Are you learning that from some influencer? Huh. Please. Please tell me you're not learning this from an advertisement. Oh, now I know what a real man is. That beer commercial told me that. No. Listen, gentlemen, God himself tells you what it means to be a real man. Ladies, God himself tells you what it means to be a real woman. No one else gets to define that. No one else gets to define what is significant in the workplace, in the church, in the family, in your hobbies, in every other area of your life. God alone gets to call the shot on that. So you must have a perspective that God defines what is significant and you need to flush the other images of significance from your mind. Second, seeing the significance, seeing significance in the ordinary is gonna take some humility. You cannot be significant apart from God. If you're hoping to find significance in the house that you have, the vehicle you drive, the money you have, the intellect you have, your athleticism, your bank account, your retirement, your business, 
your beauty. You may find it hard to hear this next sentence. Those things don't count. Sorry. Those things don't count. God sees significance in people who are less skilled, less successful, less intelligence, less athletic, perhaps than you. And the pride that we tend to take in those kinds of things actually prevents us from having the ability to discover and appreciate the significance that God wants to give us. And so you're going to have to have humility to say, all the stuff I got and who I am isn't what makes me significant. You're going to have to follow James' instruction and humble yourself before the Lord. And when you do, he'll lift you up. When you begin to humble yourself before God and say, I thought this was giving me significance. Tell me what really, what significance really means, God. When you humble yourself before him that way, then you begin to realize your significance. And it changes everything. This idea of seeing significance in the ordinary requires that you trust what God has done and will do on your part. You trust that he won't forget. That's really what significance means, right? You're not forgotten. And to, to have that kind of trust, you really need to be willing to commit yourself to trusting God. I mean, hearing the words that say, there's great significance in the ordinary, that's not gonna change anything. But understanding those words, that God is where the significance comes from, and saying, okay, God, I believe you are the source of my significance, that, that's something you can sink your teeth into when you trust him. And you can trust him because the scripture tells us that God is not unjust, he won't forget your work and the love you have shown him as you've helped his people and continue to help him. Do you believe him? You can trust him when you trust his word. And God can help you see the significance of what would otherwise just be an ordinary life. Think back to that sentence that Bag used to kind of pull this truth out of these two chapters. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? You don't have to be famous. You don't have to be extraordinary. You simply need, you simply need to be someone who's trusting in Christ and following his word. And when you're doing that, you embody significance of the ordinary, and God writes your name on the page. I want to pray that we would have this as a firm concept rooted in, in our very being, and that we would never, we would never have contempt for the ordinary, but we would see its significance in others, in, in, our, in our job, in our workplace, in our life, in our hobbies in our relationships, in our church family, in the kingdom. I want to pray that as we take communion in a few moments, that our hearts would be saying to God, I want to see the significance that you give me, and I want to live my life based on that significance. So if you would, please stand with me, and we'll speak to God in prayer. Wow, you know, here's a big surprise. The Bible's right. <laughs> Paul's right when he says all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Who would have thought those passages of those lists of names could speak to us the way they did? Have you been spoken to today? Because I have. I wrote this sermon, I preached it once, I preached it a second time, all three times it's been speaking to me. Let's speak to God and ask him to help us to assimilate this truth into our life. Would you bow your heads? Father in heaven, we are thankful for your great love for us. 
love that you have poured out upon us, and that alone would make us significant. We are thankful that you cherish the ordinary, that you have made us <laughs> in your image to, to perform the extraordinary task of displaying the glory of God, and we do it just by doing ordinary things in your place. May we grab a hold of the reality that there are certain things in this world you have for us to do, and we're just the right person to do them. And when we do them, we exhibit the reality that we have significance in, in our lives. I pray, Father, that you would forgive us for looking the wrong place for significance, that we would humbly dismiss those things, and we would only want the significance that comes from loving you, loving others, showing honor, showing respect, showing care, being like Jesus. Fasten those thoughts to our heart so they do not come loose. May they penetrate our very being and change the way we view reality. For the sake of Christ Jesus the Lord, amen. Amen, you may be seated.